What did Jesus of Nazareth look like? Was he light-skinned or dark-skinned? Was his hair black or blonde or red? What color were his eyes? The truth is, we don't have answers to these questions. The writers of the Gospels didn't give us a description of his physical appearance. He never sat for a portrait. He never took a selfie. But in the 2,000 years since his ministry launched one of the largest religions in the world, Christians across time and cultures have created a diverse set of images depicting their Savior. Sometimes these images were evangelistic tools, meant to help spread the gospel in a world where literacy was rare, and therefore the Bible couldn't be read. In other cases, these images were made as visual aids for prayer and worship rituals, meant to help Christians in their religious practice. As the church has evolved, fractured, and reformed over the years, certain traditions have placed a greater emphasis on visual representations than others, with the Eastern traditions being more likely to value artistic representations than their Western cousins, the Catholic and Protestant churches. In modern Western society, the word originally used for these images, icons, has re-entered modern vernacular with an entirely new meaning, and has left me wondering, what would religious icons look like in our postmodern society? What does Jesus look like when we hold the brush? In modern vocabulary, something is iconic if it is widely recognized and well-established, reflecting the contemporary obsession with celebrity. Icons are those individuals and images which are immediately recognizable to a large number of people, like the Nike swoosh, McDonald's golden arches, and the Kardashians. But before this modern usage became the norm, Icon meant something else entirely. Originally, icons were sacred images used in worship and prayer across a range of Eastern Christian traditions. They often depicted Jesus and his mother Mary, though other saints like Peter and illustrations of stories from the Bible, like the Adoration of the Magi, were also popular subjects. They were and still are used as vehicles for prayer in Eastern Orthodox and even some Catholic traditions. Icons offer an image on which to meditate as one communes with God, like a window into the divine. Postmodernism is a big, complicated topic involving the convergence of a number of influences that have shaped contemporary life, but for the purposes of this video, I'm going to try to keep things simple. Forces like globalization, mass media, the emergence of the internet, and late-stage capitalism have all had enormous impact on the world we live in today, but to truly understand our postmodern world, we have to first look back to modernism. In the late 19th and 20th centuries, industrial revolution, increased urbanization, and the decay of colonial empires created a culture in which absolutes were viewed with skepticism, and the idea of a universal human experience connecting all people across all cultures started to erode. As advancements in communications technology, such as the telegraph, telephone, and eventually television, paved the way for a more connected world, people across all different cultures were exposed to the experiences and narratives of other people from all other parts of the world. And often these experiences were vastly different from the ones they'd known, which led many to question their understanding of the world and the beliefs they held cultural thought began to tend towards relativism and pluralism as we began to understand that an individual's beliefs and experiences are often shaped most strongly by factors outside their control, like where they're born and how much melanin is in their skin. 
In postmodernism, this relativism is carried to its extreme, and coupled with the belief that meaning is something we create out of, or impose onto, our experiences. Instead of there being a grand narrative of universal human experience, as pre-modern thinkers believed, postmodernism says that it's up to you to create your own narrative out of the various influences you interact with. As I was thinking about all of this one day, I had an idea for a series of images examining representations of Jesus from a postmodern perspective. Icons reproduced from various images across time and cultures in a modified pop art style emulative of Andy Warhol, who was both the poster child for our contemporary concept of celebrity and an incredibly devout Byzantine Catholic Christian. I started researching and eventually decided to start my series of paintings with three images taken from diverse cultures in the first millennium of Christianity. I started with this image, based on an engraved gemstone currently held in the British Museum. Unfortunately, I can't show you images of the original for copyright reasons, but if you check out the description, you'll find a link to the British Museum's website where you can view the original. The gemstone this image was based off of has been dated to the late 2nd or early 3rd century, and is one of the earliest depictions of Jesus ever created by Christians. There are a number of differences between this image and later depictions, namely that Jesus' legs are shown spread apart, and his hands are tied rather than nailed to the cross. Not pictured in this reproduction is the text engraved around the image, which some scholars have interpreted as being indicative of its use in ceremonial rituals such as baptism. The next icon is based on this image of Christ Pantocrator, or Christ the ruler of all, which comes from a monastery at the base of Mount Sinai in the 6th century. I chose this image because, apart from being one of the world's oldest Byzantine icons, it illustrates an important aspect of icons that is different from the current trends in depictions of Jesus. While current depictions, particularly in American media, tend to focus on racial accuracy, a trend that's understandable in the wake of colonialism, icons tend to focus instead on attempting to convey the unseen aspects of their holy subjects through the use of visual language. If it sounds like an impossible task to convey unseen attributes through a visual medium, then perhaps you can understand why some traditions consider the creation of an icon to be a miracle in itself. Miraculous or not, this icon makes heavy use of symbolism to show the dual nature of Christ. Check out the link in the description for a full analysis. The third icon in this series is based on a fragmentary painting from Western China at the end of the 9th century. The painting was discovered in the Mogao Caves, a temple complex in the Gansu province of China. The majority of the art and artifacts in these caves are Buddhist in nature, and this image even shows some Buddhist influence in its pose. But we know that it's a Christian image because of the crosses present on the necklace and headpiece. This cross on lotus image is a symbol associated with the Church of the East. Together, I think these images make a good start to this series. I hope to continue researching and recreating icons like these from cultures all around the world and across the entire 2000 year history of the church. I hope you'll stay tuned to see what my next icons are. In the process of creating these paintings, I first created digital versions before hand painting the final versions. And if you'd like a print of one of these digital versions, you can check out the link in the description to find out how you can get one. Thank you so much for watching this video, and I hope I'll see you next time when we make something new. Bye.